Hi, I'm Amy McGann, a Managing Director in Dixon Eaton's Media Relations Practice, and I'd like to welcome you to our latest Brain Food session. Today I'm here with a panel of subject matter experts to talk about the implications of the Business Roundtable's Restatement of the Purpose of a Corporation, which was released on Monday, August 19th. On our panel today are, to my far left, Greg Labar, Senior Managing Director, who leads Dixon Eaton's Environmental, Social, and Governments and Sustainability Communications Practice. Next to him is Angela Rodenhauser, Senior Vice President, who co-leads our Investor Relations Department. And next to me on my right is Karen Bonev, Senior Vice President, who oversees our Employment Engagement Practice and Change Management Focus Area. And on my far right is David Hertz, Managing Director, who leads our Media Relations Practice. So let's get started. Uh, Greg, could you please give us an overview or a quick synopsis of the Business Roundtable Statement? Sure. So as many of you have probably read in the last week, uh, Business Roundtable issued an announcement on August 19th that they have um, redefined the purpose of a corporation. This is a document that they have updated from time to time uh, since 1997. Every time they've updated it, it has said that the primary role of a corporation is to be profitable and create value for shareholders. Uh, the news here is that the uh, the idea that shake, uh, state, uh, shareholders are the most important and the prime uh, value driver is changing. And so this group of CEOs has decided that there's more of a stakeholder model, which means that it's uh, more than just uh, the investor that should be benefiting from the company. So it's employees, communities, and so on. Uh, the significance of this is that the roundtable is one of the largest and most influential uh, business groups in the country. Uh, 181 CEOs signed this um, this statement uh, out of 193 who are in the organization, so almost all of them. Um, but it's interesting because while they're all very large companies and they have a lot of influence, it's also true that they do represent less than 5% of public companies in America. So I think one of the reasons we're here is to talk about what does it mean for the rest of us? What does it mean for communicators and investor relations officers? And what does it mean for um, company management as they figure out how to navigate this new uh, mindset? So I'll throw, thanks Greg, I'll throw this out to all of you. How significant do you think this really is? Or is it, is it going to change things dramatically or is it primarily symbolic? So I think in terms of um, employees, it's really interesting in, in timing um, due to two big trends. So a lot of organizations are fighting for, um, are looking to recruit and retain top talent and are having a tough time doing so. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, more and more employees are becoming vocal about their organizations, everything from equality to discrimination to pay equity, mm -hmm. even to the customers and the clients that organizations work with. So I think for organizations like this to say, you know, we're not just focused on shareholders, we're focused on all of our stakeholders, and help um, position these companies as employers of choice, and maybe distinguish them from other organizations, and then maybe put them out in front of others. So it could be a boost for hiring and uh, recruiting and retaining, but we'll wait to see. So Karen, regarding employees, do you see a difference in more seasoned workers versus you know workers just entering the job market, millennials, and, the, and that kind of thing in terms of what they're looking for in an employer? Um, so I think employees are people who are just coming out of college, mm -hmm. um, first time folks who are having a job, they're really looking for organizations to have a purpose and a mission outside of having, you know, just making money. Um, so this can definitely speak to them, but I know also that organizations are having a tough time recruiting mid-career professionals as well. Um, and so maybe this will help um, set those organizations apart from others. Okay. Anyone else want to weigh in on how significant this really is? I think it's a significant milestone, certainly, but um, two questions that I think about are, will these companies actually follow through on what they say they're going to do and their revised missions? And then from a shareholder standpoint, how do they feel once their role has shifted away from them or the focus mm -hmm. on them? So. You know, and it's also, it's interesting because Jamie Dimon mm -hmm. said that this change doesn't reflect a change in the approach of the typical CEO of a publicly traded company. He said that the previous statement of purpose didn't accurately reflect what was already taking place mm -hmm. in corporate America. Mm -hmm. And so in many ways this is simply an articulation of something 
that was already taking place. Mm -hmm. And so if that is true, then shareholders shouldn't see much of a shift in their being prioritized or not. It's just that the other audiences, the millennials and the community and the employees should see an increased emphasis in what they're going to uh, be uh, enjoying from corporate America. Okay. Yeah, the only thing I would add on that is um, I think of it as kind of like a catalyst mm -hmm. and you know with any kind of catalyst it's probably what's most important isn't the catalyst but what happens next. Mm -hmm. Do people change behavior? Do they change attitudes? Does it reinforce what they already believed? Does it impact how investors think about this? Or, you know, but I don't know that it turns a big battleship around all of a sudden. It's more like what happens next. Yeah. And so that will be interesting to, to watch and to participate in and help companies uh, manage that. So what, sorry, Karen? Well, I was just going to say that, and at times, you know, these audiences or these stakeholders, they have their own unique needs, but sometimes those needs conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. So what's good for the business might not be good for employees, or what's good for the business might not be good for the environment. So how do you juggle all of those different needs? How do you juggle all of those different audiences while keeping true, you know, to the statement that's been put out? Mm -hmm. So what is next then? Greg, you mentioned, you know, what's next. So what challenges and opportunities does this present for companies, both large, medium, and small? So my reason for saying what happens next is I think it for people who, or organizations who either are big on integrated communications or, would, or think there's a direction to move in that direction or an opportunity to move in that direction, this is like their moment, right? This is like all these CEOs have said this is really important, and then they can make the case to their CEO. I think for everybody else, it might be a little bit of a wait and see. Mm -hmm. But for those who are really on board with this notion, this could be the moment they need it to get over the top. Uh, it also, it, it's important, I think, to consider this as a, as a bellwether kind of moment. This, mm -hmm. this kind of statement doesn't happen in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. The last mm -hmm. time that uh, a statement was um, restructured the way it was, it was 1997. So this is, this is an important time for the business roundtable. It also provides some cover for corporations that may have been thinking mm -hmm. about making these kinds of changes. And, and when they made the announcement, they said that uh, we should look for other announcements coming in the coming weeks. Okay. So it, it will most likely offer either opportunities or create pressures on other companies of, of any size right. to think ahead and consider what it means for them and, and how they want to communicate to these various audiences. Okay. In terms of employees, I mean, the, the statement was very specific around mm -hmm. things like diversity and inclusion, training, um, pay equity. Mm -hmm. So if organizations aren't proactively talking to their employees about that and what they're doing as an organization for their employees, they'll probably need to step that up. Mm -hmm. And I can see at the same time employees, you know, who are becoming increasingly vocal, starting to ask their organizations, what are you doing around diversity and inclusion and right. pay equity? And I think organizations need to be prepared with a response to that. What I, you, go ahead. I'd <laughs> also um, say that companies also need to be prepared, prepared to speak to their employees in a different way. Um, many mm -hmm. of these employees are shareholders yeah. as well. So they'll really need to think about how they communicate um, in this new era. Yeah, I always thought that that was an interesting point because employees are shareholders, right? So um, that audience has had a dual role for some time with these organizations. Angela, do investors really care about these other, you know, softer factors, or are they really still focused on share price? Absolutely. ESG has definitely intensified um, and investors are paying more attention to it over the past few years. You'll see shifts in um, shareholder activism and the topics coming out of that such as board diversity and climate change. Um, investors are paying attention to rating agencies and there's also an increase in standards such as GRI and SASB. So this is certainly a hot button issue with investors and they are paying attention. Greg, what are you hearing in, uh, from your clients or in the industry uh, in terms of sustainability and ESG? I think I, I would support everything Angela said. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's kind of like it's been a long time coming, mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel like it's a tidal wave yet. It just feels like it's a series of 
um, a series of catalysts, mm -hmm. and this is the latest, and you know, it's going to cause a few more conversations that wouldn't have happened before or that are now happening at a, an elevated level. So there are some conflicting opinions on this. The Business Roundtable and the Wall Street Journal editorial page have very different views on this. So who's right? I mean, both are very you know, authoritative business sources. So who's right and, and who's wrong? You know, I don't know if there is a, a right mm -hmm. and a wrong. The different ways of looking at it, the Wall Street Journal certainly has said that this is a statement is, is appeasing socialism mm -hmm. in the United States. Uh, and others are saying, like Jamie Dimon are saying, you know, we're not changing what we're already doing. We're just articulating it uh, mm -hmm. in a way that better reflects what we're already doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does, as I said, raise questions and raise opportunities that companies are going to need to think about. And in terms of what, are, are they going to start paying em employees more? Does this help them do that? Will employees start requiring that they get paid more? Uh, and will the tight labor market uh, play into that? It does trigger all different kinds of, of questions. Okay. I think really it's, you know, we've talked about this, so what next? Now that they've signed this, what changes, what behaviors are going to be different? If it's something that companies have already been doing for a long time, some of the organizations have been called out very publicly for their culture and for their values and how they've treated employees. Um, you know, others have been lauded as being employers of choice while others haven't been. So what do these organizations do now uh, in light of this? And it's interesting too, just from a global perspective, because you know, you've got managers in Germany saying, well, this is how we operate all the time. And then in other areas of the world, it's very different. Um, this is very different from what they do. And many of the organizations that sign this statement are global organizations. So they've got employees around the world that they need to talk to. So let's talk about what companies should do. You know, as you said, some are probably doing a lot of, of what they mentioned in the, the restatement already. But if a company's kind of caught off guard by this, they're not doing some of these things already, where is an easy place to start, or how do they even get started with this? I'll, I'll start on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, it's easier to say <coughs> that to ignore this is most likely a mistake. Mm -hmm. To think that this is going to uh, mm -hmm. blow over uh, is probably not the best strategy. So best thing for companies to do is to sit down and say, is this an opportunity for us? Does this really reflect what we're already doing? Uh, are we adequately communicating what we're doing to these audiences? If the answer is yes, then, then they're good. But most likely there are ways that they can think about what they're, how they're communicating who they're communicating to, and and at the very least tweak what they're already doing. And from an invest investor relations standpoint, you know there are certainly going to be implications for uh, IROs and how they communicate various disclosure items related to this. They're going to need to think about their relationships with analyst investors, how they communicate it to the street. Okay. I was going to say, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that a lot of companies need to think about is um, these are such big companies who signed this. If you're in their supply chain, mm -hmm. you should be thinking about this, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're going to be talking about, you know, part of a leader, what a leader does, especially that size organization, a leader leads and a leader sets the standard and a leader encourages and brings others along and eventually maybe wants to report on what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So if you're a big supplier to one of those companies that's a signatory, um, it's probably only a matter of time before somebody asks you, well, what are you doing? And um, we value you as a supplier. We value the relationship, but we also uh, would appreciate it if you were uh, more active and more forthcoming on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, a, that's something for companies who, you know, maybe right now think they're kind of below the, uh, below the fray mm -hmm. to just be mindful of. So a lot of the signatories of the, the new commitment are CEOs of large public companies. What do you think this means to more small or mid-sized companies, uh, B2B companies, those in, you know, a lot of which we find in the Midwest? What should they be thinking about? 
So I know that some of you know some of those organizations likely compete with the people who signed that document or the organizations that signed that document. So in terms of employment and recruiting and retention, they'll want to take a look at what they're doing. You know, is this an opportunity for them to strengthen their communications to employees? Do they have a differing point of view? Um, and just see how that compares with those organizations that they compete against. Okay. We often talk to our clients about the benefits of being proactive mm -hmm. rather than reactive. Mm -hmm. uh, this is such a strong statement. Wouldn't it feel better to be proactive, to have thought about your position vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the elements of this statement and to either change your communications and your policies toward it or to be prepared with a holding statement or proactive communications to, to sort, of, so, sort of head off any criticism that, that this may lead to. Okay. And they may get questions from investors and other constituencies um, in the coming weeks and months about how they plan to handle um, this shift and if their company will be adapting and adhering to the new roundtable statement. Angela, what are the corporate governance implications of this? Interesting question, Amy. It's a little too soon to tell at this point, but it does seem like shareholder groups will be concerned that they are not the primary voice for these companies anymore. In fact, the Council for Institutional Investors has already come out with a statement that they respectfully disagree with what the roundtable has stated. Hmm. And what is the message that's being sent to activist investors? So I can take that. Oh, okay. I, think, um, I think it's actually going to be really interesting to see what happens because um, there is certainly some possibility that uh, ESG activists are going to be emboldened by this. Um, quite honestly, I feel like they're already feeling emboldened, so by all the other things that have happened. Um, I think the, the other way to look at this is that ESG and attention to corporate responsibility could become more normalized mm -hmm. and, you know, as it becomes more and more mainstream, there, you would think there would be less and less um, room for controversy and more about common ground and what can we do together to, you know, make everybody, uh, help everybody improve. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think it's a, a foregone conclusion that this is, you know, going to change activists fundamentally, but I do think uh, it will be something to watch for sure. And. Um, it, we know that activists are, as, as you mentioned, you know, climate change, diversity, and you know, this is all coming at a time of, you know, coming off of all the discussion about the Me Too movement and, you know, the two degree uh, science on climate change, and now it's down to one and a half degrees. So there's a lot of the timing is such that people are already thinking about it. So how can companies avoid being caught up in the politics of this? It's going to be a contentious uh, 12 to 18 months mm -hmm. now, right, with the election. Uh, the, the round table actually uh, has already gotten caught up in this before. They, they weighed in on the immigration issue mm -hmm. uh, with President Trump. Uh, and it's going to be hard to avoid get, getting caught up in the animosities mm -hmm. Uh, that, that are being generated through the election and so really preparing and, and understanding what their messaging is going to be on the, this issue and being able to back it up is is the best way to go if they're able to be proactive then they're, they're going to uh, probably be better prepared for this whatever proactive looks like for an individual company putting out a statement or just having a statement ready or a new policy ready uh, for their internal audiences as well as their external. Well, and we've seen employees um, speak out against contracts or clients or customers that organizations have. Um, so I think if an organization hasn't already, now might be a good time to take a step back and just look at different risk issues or potential issues and not necessarily communicate proactively around them, but know what they are and maybe be prepared to talk to employees about why they have certain clients or why they have certain mm -hmm. customers um, so that they're not caught um, unawares and they're, they're ready to communicate when necessary. Yeah, my sense would be that um, if, if this weren't so political, um, the Wall Street Journal editorial would have been a little more um, moderate on how they felt about this. I think the fact that 
there are so many bills in Congress right now that kind of deal with this that mm -hmm. I think the worry of the journal is that um, some of these uh, bills that they consider very unfriendly to business might gain traction. So it's things like employees would be able to select some directors on a board instead of the shareholders selecting. Another one would be you can't buy back stock unless you're paying everybody at a certain wage level. Um, very high penalties potentially for data breaches, which we know is a huge issue. Um, if you don't approve the diversity of boards, you would pay a fine. And so all those kinds of things um, sound like really good things if, if you're volunteering and you're, you know, you're working through a process to do what's right for your business. They sound pretty scary if somebody starts passing laws and penalties. And I think that's part of what has people worried from a political mm -hmm. standpoint. Mm -hmm. How does this change, if at all, a corporate communications person's job on a day-to-day -day basis? It makes it way more fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, they, they're overwhelmed now, mm -hmm. uh, and they tend to be uh, understaffed. Mm -hmm. And this does complicate things because it introduces change into the, their equation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's change uh, about how the corporate world talks about itself, how it communicates about itself. And we're talking about um, anyone from a medium -sized, small, medium-sized company to the largest publicly traded companies in the world. Uh, this adds a, a, a component that will require them to think proactively. Okay. And I, I think Sorry. it would also be interesting to see from a disclosure standpoint what comes out of this statement if things will change on that front and more will be required um, in terms of disclosure. So how are they going to measure the changes that, are, that they're talking about? What are the new metrics that will come out because of it? That's exactly what I was wondering too. You know, what is now sort of the new standard by which we're going to measure things against? How do you show that you are, you know, engaging all of these different stakeholders and that um, you, you know you're paying sort of equal measure to all of them? What are the standards that we're going to measure um, companies against going forward? Okay. Well, you've given us a lot to think about. One more question: If you had to pick one key takeaway from this uh, restatement of the new purpose of companies, what would that be? I think how interconnected all of these stakeholders really are now. I mean, it was true in the past, um, and certainly now more than ever, but really you can't talk to one audience without impacting another one. And so you need to be mindful of what you're saying, not only to shareholders, but your employees and your customers, and making sure that those messages are integrated. You know, life uh, for the corporate communicator has become far more complicated. Uh, CEO is the top corporate communicator. You've got people at various levels of a company. They are corporate communicators. And instead of saying we have one job, that is to make money for shareholders, that is now changed. And we have now one job, that is to add value to our communities, to our employees, to act ethically to our suppliers. Oh, and by the way, we need to make money for our shareholders. Mm -hmm. So to Karen's point, you now have you know, four large audiences that you need to consider with your corporate communications. And thinking about this a little bit further and the companies that have signed it, as Greg mentioned, it's a small percentage at just 181 companies who've so far signed it. So my key takeaway for clients is to just think about and be prepared about how they're going to handle and address this issue. And they are going to be asked the question, so be prepared to think about how they want to move forward on it. And my answer would be that um, it's, you know, going back to this idea that it's a catalyst mm -hmm. and so what happens next is actually more important than what's happened so far. Mm -hmm. And it's very likely, I think, that there will be another catalyst. Mm -hmm. So what is that? Is that a significant change in the political environment or a major natural disaster that changes how people think about this or, or some other or a major piece of uh, litigation or legislation or regulation. Mm -hmm. So um, to, as you said, think ahead. What's the next catalyst and how can you get a little bit ahead of it so you're not caught off guard? Great. Anything else to add? 
Thank okay. you. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you to our panelists and to all of you for participating in this important discussion today on how this will impact companies of all sizes going forward and how they communicate with their stakeholders. If you would like more information or to speak with any of our panelists today about how to deal with this going forward, feel free to contact me. My contact information is at the bottom of the screen. And thank you again.